Welcome to our Going Green podcast. And today we're going to look at not power to the people, but power for the people. Power in the UK has sort of been hitting a sort of uh, important sort of headlines this week about sort of the hike in gas prices. Uh, but power isn't just gas. Power is sort of electric or it's gas or a small amount of oil and, well, other things like we use here, LPG. So what do we use gas for? Well, we use gas for heating. We uh, use gas for cooking. But mostly, gas seems to be used to make electricity. Yes. It, it, it's one of those things, sad things to say is that we currently burn most of the gas to make electricity which i'm not saying it is wrong because obviously you know that's how we've managed to you know boil steam and power the turbine you know and the only way we can get things to spin yeah i know there's well we, we've got rid of uh, a lot of the coal haven't we nowadays yes uh, and that's gone and and oil so well, although we were looking at um Bridwatch, yeah, and which did... is gridwatch.co.uk, yeah. recommended site to go and have a look at various things. I'll put the uh, URL in the data below so you can have a look at it. And we might, if you're really good, we might, for those watching on the video, we might put a couple of pictures. Anyway, uh, so so looking at this, for the last, over what, six months, I think it was the one of the measures, we've actually used a little bit of coal as opposed to, say, Last year, because it, it does a year by year comparison, it last year we use zero coal. Yeah, you know, and unfortunately, that is actually due to the fact, and you probably heard it in the news, is that this year has been less windier and less sunny than last year. So obviously, the renewable side of all the power generation has been less, which is a one of those things which is the major problem with all these renewable power is that they don't they're not i wouldn't say they're stable that's the wrong way to put it but they cannot directly deliver the constant power that we need it, it, it doesn't yeah. deliver what is known as base power they yeah. can deal with you know if there's a nice sunny day they generate lots of power for um doing surge power but they can't do the base generate or the base generation production of how much electricity we need. And that's turning things on, like keeping the internet on and, and yeah. those sorts of things. Well, so the, the basis really seems to be nuclear. Because nuclear, you can't sort of make more or less. Well, you it, just have to sort of have that more or less Well, the, the other thing is you can't, can't turn nuclear on and off that quickly. Yeah does take a lot of time so so whereas gas can be we've I, I was looking up we've actually still got nine coal power stations in the uk and basically the idea is to plan to shut all those down by 2025 i thought it was 2024 might be 2025 though could okay. could could be yeah. well 2024 25 it, it, it's probably it, a lot it, will go in 2024 and we'll be left with just uh, one or two yeah by then anyway so 2025 that's the that's the data i'm actually looking at the nuclear ones they use at the moment still uranium to uh produce heat that heat is used to heat the water that water is then making steam the steam drives the turbine and the turbine drives the generator and that steam that's doing that is recycled, so it, it can get radioactive. So we basically keep that going. And there are currently isn't it? eight nuclear power stations oh. in the UK. See, I was going to say, I thought it was two. Ah, uh, yeah, well, that's how many is working. Oh. Because we've actually got quite a few of them down at the moment. And we have a friend trying to work on building one of the new ones. Yeah. Right, okay, so that's coal. So we've got nine of those. Nuclear, we've got eight of those. Um, how about gas? There are 39 gas power stations, and these use natural gas to 
basically power a turbine. So again, they usually heat water and that drives a turbine, which drives the generator. Um, but you've got both. We've got in a natural gas, uh, which is called the combined cycle gas turbine. Oh, oh. Sounds terribly posh, that does. Um, they use natural gas to power a turbine, which turns a generator. And then a second system uses the heat to produce steam, which is used to drive the turbine or another turbine, which is uh, a generator. So you're getting sort of two for the price of one. So it's actually quite efficient. And then what else have we got? Well, we've also got some oil. Uh, you can burn oil to produce heat. That heat, again, heats the water, produces steam. Steam drives I'm, the I'm turbine. I'm seeing a, a pattern in yeah, that. You are noticing a pattern here, which uh, is how all these, well, just not the nuclear, but it, it's also how the fossil fuel generators basically work, all in the same way. But then we've got the other ones which are slightly different and the first of those is a biomass one oh and the biomass one we take some wood food rubbish straw whatever and guess what they do with it don't they burn it yeah and burning heats um yeah yeah heat heats it burns it like say he does a turbine, yeah. He heats the water, drives the turbine, and produces the steam, and we've got electricity, electricity. generated. Yeah. yeah. So all the same. But then we've got two others, really. Because I, I, I thought originally that the bioreactors, um, they take, say, the, the, the wood pellets, the, you know, the, the gunk and the garbage, and they basically let... Uh, they bacterial eat it or microbes eat it and that produces the methane and then they burn that methane instead can do that as well yeah biomass is not just one type of system it, it's it, it's several type so now we come to the renewable ones and the point is that we've been using something like about 30 to 40 gigawatts of power demand that's that's what we're on third a moment looking at live data all right it's it's just about half an hour old the live data tells me that we've are currently using 30.89 gigawatts in this country yeah and i imagine we're using probably sort of a, a good good portion of that here with all the studio well i don't know because the sun is shining and we have our solar panels. And when I last looked at that, we were actually taking zero electricity from the grid, even though we've got three cameras on, we've got three lights on, we've got all this in the table, all the stuff on the table, which you might just be able to see. There we are. We've got all of this sort of heating, you know, and warming the place up. And, uh, We've got a few computers on as well. And I'm using no electricity from the grid. However, when it becomes nighttime, and unfortunately as the winter draws on, it becomes more night than day, we make less solar. Yeah. Oh, well, unfortunately, that, that's what you, the only place that doesn't happen would be the equator. And unfortunately, there's not much land at the equator to do so most of it's actually ocean at the the yeah. between the tropic of cancer and capricorn yes yes you're right so anyway so 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 trying to get whereas you know the southern hemisphere has the same problem that we would in the north hemisphere where the it's the degrees of summer and winter because of course that's the earth's tilted at this 23 degrees the magical number well yeah. not really but yeah it, it's so you know, as the seasons phase, the sun does get lower in the sky, and then over summer it gets higher in the sky. Yeah, you know, as a normal phase. And so, what the Met Office or release really any uh, meteorological site does is they record the number of daylight hours, and they can predict daylight hours across the day. And you can see it does change depending on your. I'm, I'm going to say latitude, and I hope it's right. Yes, it's latitude, not longitude. 
longitudes around the Earth, whereas latitudes up and down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've got to get it right. Yeah, which which leads to why you hear um, the lovely phenomenon in both the Antarctic and the Arctic, either called the midnight sun, or the yeah, they have the longest day, as in the sun doesn't set. Yeah. So that's the midnight sun. And, but, of course, six months of the year, they have the opposite, where it's sort of barely light at all. So where does our electricity come from? We've answered that. Nuclear, and that's about 15%, varies from about 10 to 20. We've got biomass, which is now around about 5%. Yeah. Coal is actually less than 1%. But the bits that change are the gas, the wind, and the solar. And what I think they're trying to do is basically say wind's got the priority, and that goes from something like 10 to 50%. Solar, well, that depends on the day. If the sun's shining, it's about 15%. And if it's not, and if it's night, it's not. And the difference is made up with gas. And we've had a grotty year, grotty summer this year. Well, I was going to say a grotty year, but a summer particularly. It, it has been, yeah. We haven't seen the sun very much. You know, the, I mentioned an, another week that I, I went out and took a photograph of, you know, the sun coming out and the lady over the road thought I'd gone balmy. But, you know, it was a celebration. We'd actually seen the sun for the first time in about a month. I'm surprised you've not gone out today and sort of taken a picture of all the sunshine. I did. Okay. Uh, you, nobody noticed. It was it was uh, early, so nobody noticed me. Take a picture of that. Right. So we've got different sort of proportions of different things, but this summer hasn't been good. This summer, we haven't had as much wind as we've normally had, and uh, I'll see if I can put up a little comparison there to show you. But um, if you're on podcast, you, you won't see that well. Um, but basically we're looking at a graph and this graph is basically showing that we get uh a lot of well let's give them colors gray we'll have for the radioactive sort of nuclear power orange is gas and then the blue which is going to be wind and the blue goes literally up and down like a yo-yo some days it's very windy some days it's not and typically in the spring, we have, well, winter and spring and autumn, we have a lot of wind here. Yeah. yeah. And you can see that in you know, all the weather patterns, you know, that's yeah. when all the, sort of the storms are blowing through all the spring, you know, autumn storms and generally in the summer, there's not much happening. And, and what we have in the summer, typically for, for Britain, is we have this string of depressions that come across and what happens is you have some wind and rain and a couple of days of sun wind and rain a couple of days of sun uh the wind and rain usually takes a bit longer than the couple of days and that so uh, gives us a lot of wind this year we had this um wasn't high it, pressure was, over us was it or was it over us or was it not over us which was the problem no it it we, we had a great big dip in this sort of wind there's a high wind that goes across called well it's called the jet stream called the jet stream well done and that was amplified and we had a nice sort of it went up sort of round about sort of greenland iceland and made a nice dip uh below us so we were on the the cold side and either you got a little depression sitting there or you can have a high pressure sitting there and we've had this high pressure sitting here so we've had calm foggy boring sort of days where it hasn't been very warm because it's all the lovely sort of warm wind has come from greenland uh which isn't known for its warmth <laughs> and that's come down to us and keeping us nice and cool and because we're an island and it's coming across all this sort of water it picks up a fair bit of water so we've had quite a bit of rain and we've also had quite a bit of cloud so our lovely sunny days have been covered with clouds so they have been really sunny as long as you've got above the clouds yeah yeah so we've had a lot of that sort of weather this year and what that weather's caused is simply 
not well, much wind. Yeah, lack, lack of wind and lack of solar. And so we've had to use more gas and more countries are using gas. Asia is using a lot more gas. Mm-hmm. And you, we, you were talking about the Russian pipeline of being sort of shut down for a bit, but... Well, yeah, so the, the, the crucial thing, so Russia gets lots of its gas from, you know, all its states and, yeah. And basically what they do is they sell that oil or they sell that gas through, I think it's um, Turkey. Yeah, basically the pipeline, you know, through, and then basically just feed it into Europe. The critical part is that um, it's, I'm not saying it's expensive to find oil, but it is. And so a lot of investment has been going in trying to find it. But crucially, a lot of investment has been going to finding it because they've been finding less of it. So the, so the reserves are going empty, going empty. Yeah, I forgot to do that one. And so now they're trying to basically find more oil, which of course is more expensive. So they've got two problems. Firstly, they're sending less because they are producing less, but they're having to recoup some of that cost to find more oil. So basically they've every half a bit they've put through they're charging full price so they can fund all their the, the activities which well, is yeah it's yeah. research but it's also building the pipeline yeah, that to yeah. get it to europe so, so so it's not sort of economic warfare in that regard it's just standard supply and demand and um you know mark is driving that which is fair enough that's fine but they are sending less oil or less gas through to europe which of course then leads to a major problem in the gas supply of Europe, which is why we're seeing this huge um, gas price spike, or the, the the whole price gas price. Wholesale price of gas, yeah. But we've also got another problem with our electricity anyway, haven't we? That uh, France decided to get one of their little substations to catch fire. Well, I, I mean, they didn't do it deliberately. It, it was actually <laughs> no, caused, it was caused by a wildfire. Because that was happening at the time. Anyway, so we have basically two undersea cables that connect us uh, to France. We, you know, we've got one in the Netherlands, all sorts of places. Anyway, so we've got two of the connects to France. Of course, one of the sites, they had this wildfire and basically it took out the substation. It wasn't a, it was quite a large substation because it's doing all sorts of extra bits. So that, that all, so they had to close it down and they are, estimated to repair that by mid-october or you know a couple of weeks into october which means of course we're now only receiving power from france on one channel as opposed to the dual we were getting so we could do some load balancing they're they're called ic1 and ic2 and ic1 was the one with the wildfire and not so it's not working at the moment so we've got gas prices rising We've got lower wind, we've got lower solar, and basically it's been a colder year. So demand has been greater, and with less renewables, we've got more sort of uh, need for gas, which is rising the prices of not just gas and electricity, but also all the knock-on effects on the food systems, the food pipelines and which, yeah, which other is, interesting ones like the company that makes CO2. A, a good CO2. This one, we have to point out, this is good CO2. Well, it's, it's I, in a I, bottle. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not quite what you in term of being good CO2. It's one of those things where they produce a byproduct and their major byproduct is CO2. But because they're creating... Uh, it's in gas form there the reactions are basically it's under high pressure they can just simply just you know almost like a tap of water fill containers up with co2 as in there is no co2 emissions from the plant it's all basically co2 on tap oh, and what do they use that for paul give me a, give me some ideas what they do because it's quite surprising what they use well it for. You know, you've probably heard in the news all about the, the how much the CO2 is used for things like fizzy drinks and um, for the, the help on the, the slaughter of animals, for, you know, the abattoirs, essentially, the humane slaughtering of animals. But 
what actually is 50% of the CO2 production or the, the you know, actually goes to all the hospitals. And you say, oh, that's a bit. And a, a little bit of that CO2 is done by, um, for, uh, and, as, and what's the knockout gas, but not the uh, anesthesia. Like nitrous oxide. That's nitrous oxide, but anesthesia, they use a lot, bit of CO2. Yes. And, yeah. And that, that's basically to, which is, you know, why we use it for the slaughtering animal is that basically it, it does offer it us some dopey. Yeah. Before you kill them. Yeah, I know. Cerebral or cerebral. Anyway, so hospital use this to obviously make people dopey so we could operate a little more. That's fair enough. But the other crucial thing they use it for is they use a lot of gas to power lots of their equipment. You might say, what do you mean? They actually use, um, I'm not saying reciprocating saws. I mean, you know, this is obviously uh, drills and medical surgical, but they use a lot of gas. Yeah. And that gas, funny think- enough, is compressed CO2 because it's easy and it's cheap and it's no problem and they can just on demand. Yeah. Oddly, you can use a compressed air to drive quite a lot of these things, but that requires a compressor running and that uses up more energy and costs more to run than buying in something like CO2. But you were telling me you worked in a little um, establishment providing beer and you were telling me about uh, the two types of systems they were using. One has high pressure oh, and oh, one right. has low yeah, pressure. Yeah, right. So if you've ever worked in a, 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 a pub, you'll, you'll probably know this instantly, is that uh, in the cellar where your beer is, you need to pipe it up to the tap. And basically you can have two ways of doing this. You can have a, a nitrogen line doing this, or you can have a CO2 line doing it. The nitrogen's at high pressure because it's, it, it's, it's smaller. Therefore you need to, for the same force, it needs to be the high pressure. Whereas CO2 is low pressure because it's the larger molecule to push things. So that, that, that's the case in being that way. So what they're having to do in regards to the beer pulling is, of course, nitrogen is it is not very good on large establishments where CO2 is. So that there's a other problem use of it is all these lines to pump, um, I say pump, but move beer around. Um, but the problem is that they're doing going from either nitrogen to CO2 as in converting from high to low is not economical and just keeping the high line in. Whereas if you convert from low to high, you're losing all this force or you know pressure, but it's also high pressure can, I don't want to say explode. That's the wrong way to put it, but it's, you've got a maintenance is heavy, heavy on it. Much heavier maintenance. Is it possible Where, to maintain it? Yeah. Whereas the low pressure you can effectively do just with a, a, a glorified plumber. The maintenance is so much lower because you're not having, you aren't having these pipes that are pressurized. Basically they're just containing the, the, the gas inside and they can just, you know, so it's easier on that, which is what lots of large establishments, they have the CO2 lines as opposed to smaller ones where they usually go for nitrogen because it's the same bang for your buck pushing power. Or half the cost because nitrogen is, I say, cheaper than the CO2. At the minute, it's it's not quite. Yeah, and especially at the moment when there's a CO2 shortage, uh, some sort of pubs are starting to panic, thinking, oh, are we going to be able to get the beer up from the barrel into the sort of but it's, it's, establishment? It's other things, you know, what they, they, they talk about, sort of they put, they pump beer, or not beer, um, they pump CO2 into the barrels, uh, and then pour the beer in. And so the beer displaces the CO2 and so in and the CO2 has already displaced the oxygen or the, or, um, or the natural air, other stuff. Yeah. Which is going to make the beer go off. Yeah. So you're preserving it effectively or not preserving it, but you keep, so, you know, there are other things, you know, they talk about how much, um, the meat, um, uses CO2 to that as a preservative instead of putting preservatives in, they just put CO2 in yeah, and then things don't go up because it's not oxidizing because there's no, no oxygen. Yeah. It's really getting rid of oxygen 
because a lot of packets of crisps when you buy those you notice they're slightly inflated and that is inflated with a gas and they can use carbon dioxide or they can use nitrogen basically you just want to get rid of the oxygen yeah so you're just blasting the oxygen out and because oxygen's the thing that's going to react with the food oxidize it and make it go off basically mm -hmm. so we've got then we've talked about power here power for the people there's one i've missed out which is hydroelectric power sounds like a really good renewable one to me and tidal power and wave power um now we live in the hemel hempstead now uh, to put that on the map for people uh if you find london and then you go sort of up a little bit and sort of west a little bit there's hemel hempstead and that's a long way from the sea so our wave power in here hemel is i could, I could jump in a, i could jump in a puddle that would increase the wave power here yeah 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 so we've got very little wave power although we're an island and we could have lots of wave power when i was a, a child there was a big study done down in southampton where i live on wave power and they built some of these uh, they were called ducks these little floating things and um they found they weren't very efficient and they didn't make much uh, sort of electricity and it was better to use oil and gas instead now i will point out that that was a, a study done by a company called esso which was an oil producing company and uh, it was funny that they didn't find it more efficient but um when they've revisited it now they are finding that it's 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 better it, it can do the the it can serve as a base because of course that that's the yeah they they talk about different what power production can be you know and then we talked about um nuclear being based but they were talking about how tidal or at least wave can be used as base power because of course it's you know we have tides and tides are fairly regular we know about they're regular yeah. and then we can every day every day but they can't between tides they're, they're a bit rubbish but but that's 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 only if you're doing tidal power if you're doing tidal power then you've got low tide and high tide when it's going to generate the most electricity and when you've got to that little awkward bit in the middle where it's neither high tide or low tide then it's not really going to do much but then if you've got it on an estuary you're still going to get some flow of the water out anyway and uh we don't have one in this country uh france has got laurence which works quite well but no one seems to have the guts to sort of build a barrier across the seven i i see lots of objections about that that it will kill all the fish and various other problems so uh, they just don't want to do that uh so we've got lots of wave potential power and we could have that all around uh, the country we could do that we've got uh, one up in the orkneys now yes i think was it the largest wave thing yeah, yes yeah. yeah so they 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 are starting to work and do things so you know there, there's potential to do an awful lot more there so we've got a lot more in the way of tidal and wave power that we can do hydroelectric well if you live in scotland where we've the only bit of basically great britain that we've got sort of large lakes of well and mountains yeah uh then the water comes down there and you can drive uh some hydroelectric power um norway does really well but you know where we live it's pr it's pretty flat and uh, trying to persuade sort of water to sort of generate some electricity it's sort of not going to be very much and if we go to wales then what we've got there are reservoirs that are up and down and they use them to fill up during the uh, night and then during the daytime they release it from the up down the down and it makes it basically doesn't make any electricity net electricity it does make some but then they use electricity to drive it back yeah it's it's the whole storage in in regards to how do you store power you store it as the 
it higher up and then when you need it you can just flow it down but the critical thing they do is when electricity power is cheap when we're producing a lot of um energy that's when they use it yeah they they usually use a solar power to that's that's to drive it up as opposed to anything else yeah and and of course this is widely used and famous for when we have a football match and the whole country is watching the football match and suddenly half time comes everyone goes to put the kettle on and that's when they need to use the HEP well we've done our half hour it's we have. gone very quickly for me and what i can do is say thank you very much for watching or listening and next week we'll have a look at some more topics about going green so until then it's goodbye from me and a goodbye from me as well bye bye bye